all the characteristics of the philosophy of the heat model. Now we will look, take a look at the philosophy proper of the heat model. And slowly from philosophy, we will move to the actual model of the building. And when we do that, this discussion will be useful because when we operate the model of the mind, at times we will be using certain elements of this philosophy that we are discussing. And that makes the heat model of the mind a psycho-philosophical spiritual model and not a classical secular model which is disjointed from spirituality or philosophy. So the first concept in the philosophy of heat model is the idea of reality, the source of everything and the ultimate destination of everything. It is the ground of all grounds. It is the grand ground, so to say, from where everything emanates and into which everything coalesces. So reality is the grand ground. It is also the purpose and it gives the purpose. It is beyond comprehension by definition. This is very important. It's beyond comprehension by definition. That there cannot be a full capture by the mind of that reality. And this reality, from this reality emanates the principle. The principle is the ground of our universe. From reality can emanate many principles, each for any given universe. So we are speculating philosophically of a multi-universe possibility. So the principle is the ground of our universe and the principle has a purpose, the purpose that involves purpose for the universe, earth, history of man, the soul of man and the man himself in his everyday life. And this principle essentially is based on two elements. It operates essentially on two elements, the element of law and the element of freedom. The element of law manifests itself in terms of the laws of nature, whereas the element of freedom manifests itself in those elements which are not accounted by any deterministic law. They refer to the free will of reality, free will of the individual, chance, suprahuman will, and power of suprahuman entities, be it a force or be it a being. So it is psychologically speaking, intellectually speaking, where we can go is towards the principle at the most, the reality remains unknowable. And in principle, much of it can be known, but there may be an unknowable we are not sure of. The third element in the philosophy is the operation part of it. How does it operate? So the philosophical understanding is that from the principle emerges existence regulation and destruction. So what the principle does is creates a law that allows for existence, regulation and destruction. And that creates laws which will power each of these three processes. And these laws are fundamental laws and empirical laws. The fundamental laws are the laws that are behind existence, regulation and destruction in a most fundamental sense. 
and then we have empirical laws of science that what we know about and from there emerges the after the laws are created gets created the universe earth life mind man and with man comes the model of the mind with man comes the mind because we want to understand it comes the model of the mind and there once we have this kind of a picture we realize the mind is affected influenced by so many elements and we are far away from a complete theory from man we move to society and to history and it is all related to each other in one organic whole sense so the approach here is more hegelian of what organic whole instead of stopping with immanuel kant of the knower and the thing in itself that cannot be known so even while we accept kantian position that there would be an unknowable the knower and the thing in itself both are embedded in one organic reality which is moving teleologically to a purpose so these are certain first points the first 11 points on the philosophy of it as we go along i elaborate some more points and i elaborate these points also we come to the next important element of the heat model of the point the element the philosophical aspect of explaining event causation if we put a question why should any event happen at all or if we take up any event whether in psychology or outside of psychology how can in generic terms we explain the causation of any event philosophical approach from heat model gives 11 reasons generically speaking why any event should happen at all or any any how any event can be determined at all this event 11 elements are first is self journey or oh, this spelling mistake self journey or journey of the self let me just correct it journey of self so the soul has a journey and because the soul has a journey what the soul does is we will see when we go into the model of the mind that the soul takes essence of all experiences for example uh, i eat sweets and there is a sense pleasure i listen to good music and there is a sense pleasure i read a good book and there is intellectual pleasure i do a noble deed and there is an ethical pleasure and this from this pleasure or correspondingly there can be pain maybe i fail and i feel pain from this pleasure or pain the soul derives some essence and once this essence is developed by the soul and internalized it develops the development goes on to a point where the evolution gets complete and therefore every soul has a journey and this journey of the self you call it self or you call it soul this journey of the self is one very important element why any event happens many events happen because the soul wants it to happen because it wants a particular kind of experience for its own journey second important category of forces or causes is the journey of the universe so there are certain entities which have to be processed in the journey of the universe and of course we are not talking in scientific terms we are talking in philosophical terms over simplified assume that in the entire journey of the universe say x amount of anger has to be processed and that can be processed by through animals 
some component through animals, some component through birds, some component through human beings. And the entire human race, let us say, has to process 0.7x of the whole x. And each individual, let us say, has to process between, let us say, some amount A to B of that anger. So across all lifetimes, so much of anger you have to process. That processing can be feeling, it can be showing, it can be transcending, but you have to process it in some way. And you can look at all fundamental emotions, all fundamental cognitive elements, that they have to undergo certain processes in this journey of the universe. And this journey of the universe entails that so much of anger will get processed, so much of happiness will get processed, so much of cognitive epistemological elements will get processed in different ways. So that is one big force which will be hidden deep underneath subterranean causing events on the surface we call history. There is second force, the journey of the universe. Slowly as we go in details of it, we will start applying this to human phenomena and it will become more concrete and specific. We are talking in generality now, which is slightly difficult, but soon we will get into specifics. Third is the karma of the self, the karmic load of the self, of the individual. Fourth is karmic load or karma of the others surrounding us. Fifth is the original karma endowed on this, on the fundamental entities of creating in process in this universe by the principle itself. And sixth is the free will of the self. Seventh is free will of others. Eighth is suprahuman forces and beings who act in our world unknown to us. Ninth is laws of nature. Tenth is chance. Laws of nature includes all of science, both pure science and social sciences. And then we have chance and then we have freedom of reality to intervene, at times even superseding the principle. So generically speaking, any event in this philosophical model occurs because of these seven forces acting in different ways, in different intensities, to cause any event. Bringing this general understanding into psychoanalysis, if this is true in general, then any psychological event can also be explained using these 11 generic forces. And therefore, if any psychological event can be so explained, then any event which generates pathology or which heals also can be explained in these 11 terms. So they, that creates a, a model, a comprehensive model to explain the pathogenesis or the real action of healing. And obviously when we come to the most important aspect of the 11 points is the laws of nature, we will stop on point nine where the current science is. And we will stop there with current unknowns. We also will see that except in 90% of the cases, we won't need anything other than laws of nature, free will of self and free will of others. Not 90%, let me say in 60% of cases, we won't need anything other than point number nine, point six and seven to explain anything. But in other cases, in some cases we will need to explain something by journey of the self, one's karmic load or suprahuman forces and beings. Now this is something in today's times people are extremely afraid of speaking about because the moment you talk about these things, although intuitively people know this creates a complete comprehensive model. Uh, everyone fears that one will be thrown out of the intellectual community. 
and therefore they don't talk about it although they individually might be believing or sympathetic to it however i don't have that problem so i just go along full force so this 11 entities if they are causing any event phenomena including psychological phenomena then we can use them to explain the psychological phenomena including pathogenesis and the way healing happens and this also opens up a large canvas for psychopath for pathogenesis and healing take for example let us take a few examples to make it more easy and specific let us say somebody has extremely high sensitivity five people watch an event and one person gets traumatized other four don't develop any problem this person has extremely high sensitivity how do you account for one way is to say i don't know that's a scientific answer then why should somebody have high sensitivity you can either say i don't know or you can use a good word to cover up i don't know by saying it is a constitution or it is a genetics but when we say constitution or genetics we are only substituting one unknown by another we are not answering the question one way is to step out of science into the area of philosophy and say it might be the karmic load the person is carrying because of which there is high sensitivity or the person person self wants to undertake a journey in a way that it wants to live out high sensitivity and that brings in a different element to our understanding and completing our giving sort of a closure to our conceptual framework next important element in philosophizing in it relates to the flavor of existence when we reflect upon the world as we encounter it what are the entities that come up and we will be using these entities as we go along this is almost like in a psychological sense in a very practical sense we are doing what heidegger did descriptive phenomenology so here we we'll use certain words some of them are well known some i have coined in my own way contextualize their meaning in my own way let us look into them because i'll be using them in the way i want them to be which will be slightly different from at times their general usage or usage in any particular school first is the idea of the real and the surreal it's a very important idea in the context of it so what is real and what is surreal normal understanding is real is something which is concrete and the surreal is something which is dreamy there is also a surreal school of thought where salvador dali used to paint what he used to dream vividly and you see that very dream like flavor to his paintings there is another meaning of the word real and surreal the meaning of the word real comes from the way lacan uses real that which escapes symbolization real is something which escapes symbolization that's the way laka uses that word okay that it is that which escapes symbolization so laka uses three categories the real 
the symbolic and the real, the imaginary and the symbolic. And the real is that part which is not the symbolic or the imaginary. And it escapes symbolization. What Lacanian thinkers is that he calls real not as a content, as a as a collection of content, but rather a formal category which by definition escapes symbolization. But I prefer a separate definition even in the Lacanian context. I would say even in the Lacanian context, the real is can be seen in two different ways. The pre-linguistic real and the linguistic post-linguistic real. Like Like, uh, uh, let us say, before the language develops, before the language develops, you have an experience. Now, there is no language to articulate it, symbolize it. So the experience is very concrete and the experience is largely unattenuated because neither you have language nor you have the capacity to attenuate. And therefore that part in Lacanian terms can be the real, the pre-linguistic real. But the second element is after language makes an advent, the real outside, which is neither imaginary nor symbolic, it is there as it is, there would be a real, which is not imaginary or symbolized or symbolic. It is there as it is. So there would be a post-linguistic real that can be one way of looking at it. I use the word real and surreal differently than Lata. For me, the exact, the pre-linguistic is real. The exact is real, but pre-linguistic is not completely real. Okay, let me rephrase it. For me, the, the exact the accurate, the utilitarian, the utilitarian, the necessity is the real. The, the bare, the bare necessity is the real. Anything that is stripped off of unnecessary imagination added to it is the real. So you take something, you strip off the imaginary part of it, you end up with the real. And the surreal is the imagination and the products of imagination and the products of effect that we add to the real to make it surreal. So when we go, let us say, go to a doctor and both of you are intensely thinking what is wrong. Both of you are exactly in the real using scientific knowledge without anything else in the mind. So dealing with the doctor, dealing with a lawyer, with a chartered accountant, if you put aside the imaginary ideas that you have of how do I look, how does he look, what does he think of me, what do I think of me? What, how is he see my status? How do I look at his status based on his office? Put aside all of those things. If you're looking only at the objective necessity part of it, which often we would call the necessary evil, we see that as real. 
and anything that is relished that is uh, ornamented with imagination i call that the surreal and the extreme form of surreal are the dreams they are the movies they are extreme forms of surreal complete surreal art completely surreal and in between are most of our things so rarely we are in a completely logical mood like logical state rarely we are completely in a fantasy state we are usually in between where there is a combination of the two and the point i want to stress is surreal is far more pervasive than we would like to believe even in areas where we believe it should be only real the surreal pervades look at the way hospitals have interior decoration it is a place which should reflect the real it is not it is loaded with the surreal so imagination affect and creativity they come together to create the surreal and the pervasiveness of the surreal is something we will explore we will have a complete journey of a few sessions to elaborate on the point surreal because unless i elaborate it in many instances it's very difficult to grasp what i want to say and for me to communicate what i want to say and this brings us to a very important element the dramatist inside that when we look at the unconscious mind it is by nature very dramatic very histrionic very melodramatic it is not realistic at all the unconscious and there is a dramatist inside all of us and who has put it there it is by our hardware nobody has created it consciously so it tells us that god loves drama god loves an eventful existence and what we realize when we look at our desires and our dealing with the surreal world in the real world we realize that the real is only a necessary evil our desire is in the surreal so the surreal is far more important than the real which is taken to be more of a necessary evil so this 11 broad circumambulating concepts we will be using as we go into the details of the gate model so they do get give us some idea about the flavor of existence flavor of existence is a very wide area we can have 111 concepts about it but i have taken cert certain things which i am going to use later on surreal i will be exploring in details over many sessions what is surreal how do we see the action of the surreal in the unconscious mind even in thinking of something which should be purely logical then how do you strip a a, a container full of ideas and feelings of the surreal content and see the only the real content there it's almost like stripping of something into eros and logos and distilling the logos as the real and the eros as the surreal some more points before we get into the actual heat model of the mind first there is some truth in every school of psychoanalysis and every school outside of psychoanalysis which has survived a long time every school is incomplete and all schools if you put together that consolidated thing also is incomplete if you develop that integrated thing that developed model is also incomplete east and the west integrated is incomplete east and the west integrated and developed also is incomplete 
and therefore what i have done in heat is to bring together western psychoanalytic models of the mind eastern psych eastern models of the mind add to it some concepts of my own develop that model further and even after doing all of it what we get is two things one the heat model of the mind is more complete than other existing models of the mind but or rather i should say yet heat model of the mind also is incomplete we are far away from anything near nearing completion so heat is incomplete but it is definitely an advance over other existing models of the mind tragedy has been people have given up work in the area of model of the mind because it is deemed to be too ambitious and most are afraid of what others will say it's almost like they are afraid of others derisively mocking at them and this lack of confidence and this lack of intellectual capability to synthesize and create a, 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 a extensive integration and the depth of the conceptual zone that has created a a stalemate in development of psychoanalysis in the area of model of the mind hopefully the heat model of the mind will restart the arrested development and although it is an incomplete model like every other model it is definitely an advance and a very large advance over all existing models of the mind and it creates actually a completely different paradigm in psychoanalysis and in psychotherapy thank you if you have any questions write to me at hvindia@gmail.com so i just wanted to say uh, that uh, 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 right now uh, what i think that people are more focused on supra humans uh, as you said they are not uh, considering these things but i think people uh, outside india there are so many things now they are using it in forensic sciences also to uh, to like uh, to solve a case particularly uh, i think they are using it right uh, these days yeah, so uh, the the distinction between rigorous empirical science and parapsychology has been a very sharp one and the mainstream empirical science still finds it very difficult to touch this subjects so particularly in psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis traditionally has been founded on materialism and atheism you was an exception who was on the idealistic side and uh, psychoanalysis did not have actually many strong believers so that also creates a difficulty uh, for many and it will create difficulty for my model also because very difficult for traditionally trained psychoanalysts to accept ideas like this and the immediate uh, attack is that what you are doing is not science it is quackery it is going back to the middle ages of superstition and unprovable blind beliefs when the fact is that we are taking recourse to these ideas only in the rarest of rare cases in most cases what we are taking into account from the whole model are the laws of nature free will of the individual free will of the other and the historical situation in which the person finds himself so these are extremely uh, empirical and scientific elements which we will be using 80% of the time 
it's only in the other 20% where we feel it necessary and the situation demands we will not feel shy of crossing the boundary of science and go into the boundary of spirituality so that is how the journey will be but it will be lot of brick beds and uh, there will be a division of those who are holistically oriented who like this model and those who are classically oriented who don't like this model at all who will feel this is like contaminating psychoanalysis there was a very interesting paper long back when i was a student at edit it's called uh, it's titled romantic and classical visions of psychoanalysis so this model is on the extreme of the romantic vision in psychoanalysis